I've played tons of Genesis games and I know what to expect from the console. Some games are great, some were bad, and some were really bad. And that's the topic of today's video, 10 Genesis games you should avoid, unless you want to know what it's like to get audited by the IRS while you're taking a bath with a toaster. These games aren't the worst on the system, but they certainly kicked my ass and I genuinely didn't have a good time with them. With that being said, let's begin. If you recall in the previous episode, which I'll link at the end of the video and also in the description down below, I talked about how much I dislike Afterburner because it's just a missile dodging simulator. But what would happen if someone else tried to make a game in the vein of Afterburner? Well, Copia System did that with the blessing of Seismic as the publisher, and it was known as Air Diver. But I feel like that's a silly name. I personally think it should be called fill up 75% of the fucking screen with a cockpit simulator. Now I will say if I put Air Diver and Afterburner 2 next to each other and had a gun pointed to my face was told to play one of them, I'd probably choose this one and there's a reason. Air Diver has boss fights, which I found to be a nice touch. At least from what I could see they look good. You never know because the cockpit's in the way. Much like Afterburner, we have missiles and we have guns. We also have air brakes and we can do maneuvers to force enemies that are trailing us to pass us. But our missiles are limited, as is our fuel, and we have to use guns most of the time. There was a sequel, but it was on the Super Nintendo and it was released as Super Air Diver in Japan for the Super Famicom. But for the rest of us, it was called Lock On. In the 90s, the best way to get your shitty sports game the attention you feel it deserved was to get some important figure from sports to endorse it, like John Madden football, Troy Aikman football, Bill Walsh football, or in the case of baseball, Tony La Russa. Now, Tony is a former MLB player, but at the time, he was a manager, specifically for the Oakland A's, and soon after, the St. Louis Cardinals. And one of the cooler aspects of this game is that he developed the AI for the managers in this game, meaning that when drafts occur, they were designed from his input, from his perspective, and it's a fairly accurate simulator. I appreciate that. That all would be awesome if the game wasn't hot garbage. Aesthetically, it looks decent. The issues are directly tied to the player AI. Sometimes you'll have players just walk off bases or not be where they're supposed to be. For example, if I have someone on second base about to run a third when I'm pitching, I shouldn't have my second baseman standing where the shortstop is standing because the AI will steal bases and they're really damn good at it too. God forbid the computer hits a fly ball over my head as a pitcher because the game will struggle to allow the player to control second base or the midfieldsman. If they're too close to each other, the control reticule jumps between the two. It happened a lot, actually. So it looks pretty, but the fielding is much to be desired. This is an early game on the Genesis. In fact, it was a pack-in for the first release cycle of the Sega Genesis in the United States and Europe. Why? Because Japan didn't give a fuck about Altered Beast. It was way more popular outside of Japan, and the guy who designed the original game, Makoto Uchida, had nothing to do with the ports to the Sega Master System or the Genesis, which is concerning because this is a Sega game. It's not like they went to a third party and asked somebody else to do it. There was zero reason for him not to be involved. Now in the game, we rise from our grave and walk to the right, kicking the shit out of anything and everything. Sometimes a two-headed wolf pops out, we kick it in the face, and we steal its ball, right? What does this ball do? Why, it imbues us with some of the most latent, homo-flexible energy you could muster in the 90s. Makes us strong. Eventually, we get so strong, we turn into animals. Hence the name, Altered Beast. To me, the game is boring and dull and it's way too easy. Like you can beat it in less than 30 minutes. Just walk to the right and kick the shit out of everything nonstop. It's a really bad port of a really solid arcade game. When I gave up on Road Rash 1, I was hoping that Electronic Arts would fix the issues with having to go beyond the capabilities of the Genesis, because in the first game, you need to go faster and faster, especially on the fifth stage. You need the fastest bike. But no, it wasn't fixed. In fact, they made it look slightly better, which is a good thing. At least you can enjoy the scenery while you're flying through the air at Mach 5 because you hit a car head on at 250 miles per hour, all because the game slowed down before a hill and reminisce on it as the cop that's been chasing you arrests you and gives you a ticket. Happens in the game. A lot. It's so frustrating to really enjoy a game for a long time and then at the absolute end, 
it goes downhill fast. It irritated me. I guess it's the psychological thing where you want to see a game through to the end, but you just can't. The Genesis couldn't handle it. Every single sports game I've ever played has issues on the home console back in the day, especially when devs were trying to figure out exactly what aspects of the sport needed to be represented. For example, baseball. We want a good batting mechanic and we want a good fielding mechanic, and we also want it to look good. It's this triangle of balance that's really difficult to maintain. That ideology was also transferred to football games as well. We want it to look realistic. We want to compete with the other companies. We want to have that perspective where we can see all of the players on the field and make sure that we can run, pass, and catch the ball, right? It's just basic game design. College football's national championship was one of the first football games I played, not only when I started on Twitch, but on my YouTube career as well. True story. And seeing that the only other game I had played that was football related at the time was 10 Yard Fight, I was excited to play this on the Genesis. Aesthetically, it looks great, but then you actually play the game. For some weird reason, Blue Sky Innovation thought it would be fun to zoom in on the screen 500% for any action that you do, be it catching a ball or running a ball. This is so jarring, and it makes rational play damn near impossible. I hated this. If they removed that one tiny aspect, this would have been a wonderful football game on the Genesis. Little history fact, though, you might recognize this game because it's a college clone of NFL Football 94, starring Joe Montana, which is part of a larger series that ended in NFL Primetime 98, which would be succeeded by NFL 2K which went strong until 2005, where EA managed to snag exclusive rights from the NFL. Ever play Primal Rage? I thought it was a really fun game, so fun that when I walked into a video game store in 2016 and saw Primal Rage on the Genesis, I was excited to bring it home, and then I played it. In the arcades, Atari games made a name for themselves with this particular game. In many ways, it was as edgy as Mortal Kombat, with you controlling these awesome supernatural beings like Talon the Raptor God of Survival and Sauron the T-Rex God of Hunger. It's cool, right? The sprite work was phenomenal, and then you play the Genesis version, and it's not only significantly dumbed down, but if you've ever messed with Primal Rage, you already know that the controls, they're kind of obtuse for what they are, even for an arcade game. Imagine trying to pull that shit off on the Genesis. It makes as much sense as a screen door on a submarine. It's rough. The best way I can rate this game is to say it's Eternal Champions with Legendary Animals if Eternal Champions was playable. No more, no less. Oh hey, a boxing game on the Genesis. You're probably wondering how this plays, because it looks kinda good, right? <laughs> like shit. James Buster Douglas Boxing is the result of Taito wanting to port their game, Final Blow, to the Genesis. Now you remember what I said earlier where companies wanted sports figureheads to endorse games? Well, there just so happened to be this guy named Buster Douglas, who knocked out Mike Tyson, Iron Mike Tyson, in 1990, right? What an accomplishment. Sign this guy up! Swap the palette! This guy's a fucking legend! Wait, what? Wait, what? Huh? Oh. Oh no. He lost to Evander Holyfield. Oh. He retired. Well, that was short-lived. The game itself is literally rock'em sock'em robots on the Genesis. You're just mashing buttons and hoping you hit the opponent, which was the norm for boxing games. There was only so much that developers could do. The game is beatable, though. It's just a chore. It's not inherently challenging to spam a punch. Sometimes it even feels like RNG, especially in the final fight. This is a hot take and I'm probably gonna piss off some people with this one, but I don't care. I can't stand any game that was published by Takara in general, and especially on the Genesis. They single-handedly ensured that the quality of games they allowed to be developed by third parties were depraved, soulless shells of what the source material was. I don't know if it's just me being bad at the game or if I'm a little bitch, but I feel that the controls aren't nearly as responsive as they were in the arcades, or for the competitors, right? Mortal Kombat 3 and Street Fighter 2 Special Champion Edition handled extremely well, so to me, I found that Fatal Fury 2 had some insane control issues, compounded with some severe balance issues. 
I don't know if they were trying to retain the difficulty of the Neo Geo title, or if Guybrain didn't know what the fuck they were doing, but Fatal Fury 2, it's rough. And guess what? So is Fatal Fury 1 on the Super Nintendo, also published by Takara if you're interested. I actually enjoy Fatal Fury, but this one, it ain't it, trust me. Play the arcade version. Fatal Fury still exists and a new game is being announced, Fatal Fury City of the Wolves. I'm excited to see what SNK has in store for us. Time to go to Yuria, fight the Death Adder. He captured the king and the princess, and if you've ever experienced a fantasy setting that involves a king and a princess being kidnapped, then you know you have to save them. Golden Axe is a legacy franchise from Sega. It was a major cash cow in the arcades, and during its initial run, it was pretty solid. It was the most successful cabinet in June of 1989, and the 18th highest grossing that entire year. So what do you do if you have a high selling game? You port it to everything. Golden Axe was ported to 13 different platforms, allowing us to choose between three different protagonists that go on an ass-kicking adventure unlike any other. And I can comfortably say, from the bottom of my heart, this game is broken as shit. Much like every single arcade port I played on the Genesis from Sega, it's clunky and it's stiff. And if you want to feel like a game is outdated the moment it hits a console, look no further than Sega AM1 and their porting abilities. What I will say? is that as a port, it is rather faithful to the arcade game. There's even a dual mode, a new ending as well. But even those few things don't matter if the game is boring. I know I rag on EA for their subpar flight simulators, but this one in particular, it takes the cake. In F-117 Nightstorm, we fly a F-117 Nighthawk, one of the dumbest airplanes to ever exist in the Air Force's lineup. We perform training missions in Nevada, operational missions in Panama and the Gulf War, and for some weird reason, we end up in Korea. And you know, I was stationed in Korea, and the only way that Kunsan Air Base ever looked like the game suggests is when I was 14 soju bombs deep into a night of partying, where the sky becomes the ground and the ground becomes the sky. You know what I'm talking about? This game is dreadful. Much like F-22 Interceptor, the game moves in seconds per frame, and the only thing that stands out is that you can choose targets rather efficiently through your onboard computer. And that's the only way you would ever know what your objectives are and where they are. Otherwise, good luck. I swear that EA would make the T6 Texan 2 a focal point of a video game if they thought it would pull in money. Probably would call it T6 Texan 2 The Revenge or some dumb shit. And that's it for me today. What did you think of this list? Are there any good or bad memories you have about the games I talked about today? Let me know down in the comments. I do read and respond to every single comment, even the mean ones. Also, we are incredibly close to 4,000 subscribers. I know in the bigger scope of things, the, the landscape of retro content creators out there, I'm a small guy. So 4,000 is a number that I never dreamed of accomplishing. And with every subscriber, another person who wants to remember a time when life was a little bit easier to live hops aboard. And thus the ability to share these moments in history and my mission to preserve their legacy succeeds ever so slightly more. Finally, the most important thing you can do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly impacts the visibility of the channel and the projects that I work on every day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify her out.